This lengthy scene is the pivotal scene in the play, as we witness Othello's seamless transformation at Iago's skilful hands, from doting husband to jealous imagined cuckold hell-bent on revenge. We will see Iago exploit not only Othello's vulnerabilities, but also his own carefully curated persona of honest Iago to get Othello completely at his mercy. As such, there is far too much material for one video. In this first part, I'll provide commentary and analysis from the beginning up to line 162. Act 3, scene 3 opens in Othello's lodgings. Enter Desdemona, Cassio and Amelia. The scene begins in medius res, or in the middle of the action. From Desdemona's first words, we can tell that we are nearing the end of the conversation and that Cassio has already begged her to intervene with Othello on his behalf. Be thou assured, good Cassio, I will do all my abilities in thy behalf. Amelia also urges her, remarking, I warrant it grieves my husband as if the case were his. Desdemona is impressed by this apparent expression of empathy on the part of Cassio's colleague, remarking that Iago is an honest fellow, and she reassures Cassio that it won't be long until she has fixed it, so that he and her husband shall be friends once more. Note how Iago is so skilful that his presence is felt even when he is not there, and that he is able to manipulate the action in his absence. Cassio is suitably grateful, declaring that whatever the result of her intervention and whatever happens to him because of it, he is never anything but your true servant. Desdemona is well aware of this and of his long-standing love for Othello, and she tries to put his mind at rest by promising him that he shall in strangeness stand no farther off than in a politic distance. In other words, he should only keep his distance as far as is politically necessary, so that he doesn't offend the locals whom Cassio has so deeply enraged. Cassio is worried, however, that it will be a case of out of sight, out of mind, and that this situation may last so long or provide so few opportunities that Othello may forget his love and service once he has been replaced. All Desdemona can do is continue to reassure him that she will not let that happen. She promises him that his place is guaranteed and that, if I do vow a friendship, I'll perform it to the last article. Pledging to nag Othello until he gives in. My lord shall never rest. I'll watch him tame and talk him out of patience. His bed shall seem a school, his board a shrift. I'll intermingle everything he does with Cassio's suit. In other words, employing a technique for taming hawks, she will keep him awake all night. Lecturing him in bed and making the dinner table seem like a confessional in church. She ends her speech with the ominous and prescient words. Therefore be merry, Cassio. Thy solicitor shall rather die than give your cause away. It's at this point that Othello enters, accompanied by Iago. Although Desdemona urges Cassio to stay and hear me speak, Cassio quickly excuses himself, confessing, I am very ill at ease, unfit for mine own purpose. And he exits. Note how Iago oh so subtly manipulates Cassio's hurried exit to make it seem suspicious pretending to let remarks slip out unintended and then professing reluctance to clarify them. Ha! I like not that. What dost thou say? Nothing, my lord, or if... I know not what. When Othello asks him, was not that Cassio parted from my wife? Iago immediately puts his own spin on Cassio's actions to sow a seed in Othello's mind which he will nurture later on in the scene, with a seemingly throwaway comment, Cassio, my lord? No, sure, I cannot think it that he would steal away so guilty-like, seeing you coming. 
Desdemona now greets Othello and, true to her promise, immediately launches into a plea to her husband to make peace with his former lieutenant, who, she says, is a man that languishes or grows weak in your displeasure. She finishes her speech, reasoning, For if he be not one that truly loves you, that errs in ignorance and not in cunning, I have no judgment in an honest face. It's interesting to note the dramatic irony in her words here. She is indeed correct that Cassio's crime has been one of ignorance and not one that has been done in cunning or deliberately, and she is right to judge him as honest. But at the same time, we know that her judgment and the judgment of all the other characters is flawed in relation to the honest face that Iago presents to the world. Desdemona tries to persuade Othello to call him back, describing him as so humbled that he hath left part of his grief with me to suffer with him. Othello, however, is not so easily won over and tries to fob her off. Not now, sweet Desdemona, some other time. He has, however, met his match in Desdemona, who refuses to let the matter lie. Note the quick back and forth here, with the pair sharing lines of verse, as she demands that Othello name the time. But shalt be shortly, the sooner sweet for you. Shalt be tonight at supper? No, not tonight. Tomorrow dinner, then. I shall not dine at home. I meet the captains at the citadel. Seemingly exasperated at Othello's evasiveness, she launches into a lengthy speech as she urges him then to pick his time for himself, while pleading with him to not let it go more than three days. Why then, tomorrow night, or Tuesday morn, on Tuesday noon, or night, on Wednesday morn, I prithee name the time, but let it not exceed three days. She argues that Cassio is penitent or regretful, and anyway his trespass or crime is so trivial that it is not almost a fault to incur a private check. In other words, it's hardly worth being told off for in private, let alone in public. She asks once more, when shall he come? And attacks him for his hesitation, demanding to know what Othello could ask of her that she would give such a similar dithering response. She lays into him, reminding him of how Cassio was his wingman when Othello came a-wooing and how he stood up for him when Desdemona spoke ill of him. So many a time when I spoke of you dispraisingly, he hath ta'en your part. Under the circumstances, how can he then demand that he should have so much to do to bring him in? How can he justify that Cassio should have such a hill to climb to get back into his favour? Note how Othello cuts her harangue off in mid-flow, as she seems to show no sign of stopping. Prithee, no more, let him come when he will. I will deny thee nothing. Desdemona, however, has not finished, declaring that this is not a boon or a personal favour, likening it instead to when she might urge him to put on his gloves, eat something nourishing or keep himself warm. In other words, what she's asking is something small that is actually of benefit to him, not to her. No, she says, when I have a suit wherein I mean to touch your love indeed, it shall be full of poise and difficult weight, and fearful to be granted. In other words, when she asks him something that will really put his love to the test, it shall be extremely serious and difficult to be allowed. Othello reiterates, I will deny thee nothing, and then asks her to leave me but a little to myself. Desdemona jokingly responds with the rhetorical question, Shall I deny you? No, thou well, my lord. And she, accompanied by Amelia, exits, with a parting shot. Be as your fancies teach you. Whate'er you be, I am obedient. Completely unaware that she has provided Iago with ample material to use against her. Othello is clearly in awe of the power that Desdemona holds over him as he affectionately curses her. Excellent wretch. 
Note the way in which his words foreshadow the ending as he predicts his own damnation and the chaos that will ensue as he wreaks his misplaced revenge. Perdition catch my soul, but I do love thee. And when I love thee not, chaos is come again. In other words, he says, let me be damned if I do not love you, and that it will be the end of the world if this is to happen. People during the Elizabethan era believed that at the end of the world all things would return to the state of chaos that had existed before the creation. Note once more how Iago is very adept at manipulating those around him, knowing when to speak and, just as importantly, when not to. From Desdemona's exit at line 89 until line 134, observe how he actually says very little, merely planting a seed of doubt in Othello's mind that Cassio and Desdemona's relationship is not what it seems, in order to let Othello's fertile imagination, encouraged by his own cryptic responses, do the rest. Note how over the course of the scene he will make statements which are honest, but will then prevaricate, insinuate and speak in generalities to cast doubt on these, never once stating a blatant lie. He wastes no time in mounting his attack, as he opportunistically uses the new information to which he has just been made privy, with a mock casual inquiry. Did Michael Cassio, when you wooed my lady, know of your love? Othello confirms that this was indeed the case and asks him the reason for his question. He did from first to last. Why dost thou ask? No reason, responds Iago disingenuously. I was just wondering. What we wondering, pursues Othello. I did not think he had been acquainted with her, Iago innocently responds. On the contrary, Othello replies, he was our go-between and frequently went to and fro with messages. Note how Iago uses questions as responses to create an atmosphere of doubt, insinuating that Cassio may have had an ulterior motive to see Desdemona alone. Indeed. And how Othello responds with his own questions, suggesting that Iago's ploy to confuse him is beginning to work beginning as he does to question Cassio's integrity, even though Iago has made no explicit mention of this. Indeed? Indeed? I indeed. Discernest thou aught in that? Is he not honest? Honest, my lord. Honest? Aye, honest. Iago's laconic response, my lord, for aught I know, or as far as I know, does nothing to placate Othello, as all it does is hint that his knowledge and his thoughts or suspicions are two separate things. What dost thou think? Think, my lord. Iago's prevarication has done the trick. Othello has taken the bait, interpreting Iago's words as his feeling uncomfortable that he has said too much and that he harbours suspicions that are too terrible to be spoken aloud. Think, my lord, by heaven he echoes me, as if there were some monster in his thought too hideous to be shown. He demands that Iago tell him what he didn't like about the way Cassio left his wife. Note how it's not just Iago's words, but also his body language that have got Othello convinced that he suspects something terrible. Thou criedst indeed, and didst contract and purse thy brow together, as if thou then hadst shut up in thy brain some horrible conceit. He urges Iago, If thou dost love me, show me thy thought. Iago's wording here is very interesting. Rather than say, I do love you, he instead says, My lord, you know I love you, as he shifts the focus onto what Othello knows, rather than what he feels, so that he is not actually lying. Othello's next speech is heavily laden with dramatic irony, as he unknowingly accurately describes Iago's modus operandi. I think thou dost, and for I know thou art full of love and honesty, and waste thou words before thou givest them breath, therefore these stops of thine fright me the more. For such things in a false disloyal knave are tricks of custom, but in a man that's just... 
their close dilations working from the heart that passion cannot rule. Iago's careful curation of his persona as a man who is full of love and honesty enables him to plot and manipulate in plain sight. Had he been known for being false and disloyal, Othello would have seen straight through him. But as it is, because he is known to be just, his behaviour is proof of unspoken, genuine concerns. Iago now returns to the topic of Cassio as he makes a truthful statement about him. For Michael Cassio, I dare be sworn, I think that he is honest. But note how he immediately puts this in doubt by insinuating through a general observation, that he may not be what he appears to be. Men should be what they seem, or those that be not, would they might seem none. In other words, he wishes that men who are not honest wouldn't pretend to be. Once more Othello takes the bait, as Iago's repeated assertion that he believes Cassio to be honest now communicates the exact opposite. Nay, yet there's more in this and he demands that Iago tell him what he is thinking. Note how, now that Othello has fallen hook, line and sinker, the balance in the dialogue switches with Iago having more lines than Othello, as he is able to more explicitly take control of their interaction. He takes the moral high ground, asserting that, although he may be bound to every act of duty, even slaves have freedom of thought and so he shall not be forced to utter what he is thinking. What if his thoughts are vile and false, he argues. There is no one who has a breast or heart so pure, but some unclean apprehensions keep leets and law days, and in session sit with meditations lawful. In other words, even those of us with the kindest of hearts will have unkind and false thoughts every now and again, as intended, all this does is convince Othello that Iago is keeping something awful from him, and he tries to guilt-trip him into speaking his mind. Thou dost conspire against thy friend Iago if thou but thinkest him wronged, and makest his ear a stranger to thy thoughts. Iago continues to prevaricate, confessing that it is my nature's plague to spy into abuses, and oft my jealousy shapes faults that are not. There is a painful irony to the fact that the more Iago is candid about what he actually is, the more Othello believes him to be self-effacing and modest. Iago insists, quite rightly, that it were not for your quiet nor your good, nor for my manhood, honesty and wisdom to let you know my thoughts. In other words, only evil can come from it, for the pair of them. Othello asks him what he means by this. Now, in direct contradiction to what he told Cassio about reputation in Act 2, Scene 3, he claims that he dare not say anything, because if he is wrong, then his good name, which is precious to him, will be irrevocably damaged. Good name in man and woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse steals trash. Tis something, nothing. Twas mine, tis his, and has been slave to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. In other words, if someone steals his money, then what he is taking is essentially worthless as it can easily pass from person to person. Stealing his reputation, on the other hand, is far more damaging as it benefits no one. The thief cannot use it for himself and he will be irrevocably poorer. The next video will pick up at line 163 as we see Iago turn up the heat until he has Othello eating out of the palm of his hand. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.